Hello, in this installment, we are going to learn about Newton's second law of rotation, which we could also call the rate of angular cha of change in angular momentum. But first, let's situate ourselves in the course. We've spoken about inertia, linear inertia, and rotational inertia, linear momentum, and rotational momentum, change in linear momentum, and change in rotational momentum. We have also looked at kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy, or linear kinetic energy, and rotational kinetic energy, which can be interconverted with each other with V equals RW. R omega, I mean. And now we are on to Newton's second law of rotation. So this is today's focus. We have in the linear world, over here to the left, Newton's second law, F net equals MA, the most common version of it. But what we learned is that really the definition of the net force isn't MA, it is the rate of change of momentum, delta P over delta T. And change in momentum is due to a change in mass or a change in velocity. And in the cases we're studying, we're studying an object, so the mass of that object will remain the same. So ultimately, we're looking at the, chain, the rate of change of velocity, delta V over delta T, which happens to be A. But fundamentally, Newton's second law is the rate of change of momentum. In the rotational world, we have the equivalent of a linear force is a rotational force. That's a torque, or the net torque corresponds to the net force. So those two are related to each other. And just as the linear force is the rate of change of momentum, the rotational force is the rate of change of rotational momentum or angular momentum. And since we're dealing with an object, it's usually not its mass or the body itself that's going to change. Its moment of inertia won't change. What will be changing is its rotational velocity. So delta V is to delta W. So we have the moment of inertia times the angular change in angular velocity, and delta omega over delta t is alpha, the rotational acceleration. So we also get I alpha being analogous to ma. So perfectly parallel constructs there. Let's just examine for a moment the, the units. So ma is kilogram meters per second squared. And I alpha, I, is, has units of mr squared, or has <laughs> quantities mr squared, and the mass is kilograms, and the r squared is meters. So kilogram meters squared is I, and alpha is going to be radians per second squared. So we have kilogram meters squared times radians per second squared, giving us kilogram meters squared per second squared. This unit and this unit are not the same. They're not the same unit. <clears throat> However, we do have this relationship that A equals R alpha. So A has a radius R, meters, and alpha is in meters per second, or excuse me, radians per second squared. So without the radians, we do end up with meters per second squared. So the way we can convert A to alpha is by multiplying it by R. So if we were to multiply this by this A um, and substitute it with R alpha, we end up with the same units as the net torque. So let's speak a little bit more generally now, conceptually, about the comparisons between these two. So first, we have our friends the hippo and the zebra. And the, we have the same zebras in both wheelbarrows and the same hippos. And they are in a race. Both at time zero will have, should have started at the same, they should have started at the same time. And their initial velocity should be the same. Zero. So what we have here is we have 
one hippo here, zebra combo, and another one here. And so what we could see is that this delta x2 and delta x1, delta x2 is about twice the size of the other one. Now this is a picture in time, so their delta t's are equal. So we know the delta t's are equal, but one traveled twice as far, so the average velocity is delta x over delta t. So what we know then is that v2, the average velocity of 2, is 2 times the average velocity of 1. It traveled twice as far in the same amount of time. And since the average velocity is, is v plus v0 over 2, and both of their initial velocities were 0, then the average velocity is the final velocity over 2, or the final velocity is twice the average velocity. And we've seen that many times in the course so far. So v is 2v, which means that we have <clears throat> v2 is going to be 2v1, the finals, like so. And acceleration is delta v over delta t. And if one experienced twice the change in velocity from 0 to v2, well, then it would have twice the acceleration. So what we know is this has an acceleration a, and this one has an acceleration 2a. <clears throat> now, what we know in both cases is it's the same zebra, twin zebras, so they have the same mass. And so we think about them being accelerated, but it also turns out the hippo is being accelerated because the hippo was also of zero velocity at beginning. So the hippo not only accelerated the zebra and the wheelbarrow, but also themselves. But in any case, the masses are equal. Well, if we have twice the acceleration, we would have twice the net force. So we can say about this hippo is it generated twice the force. Twice the force brought about twice the linear acceleration. And a whole other, uh, uh, another bunch of pertinent quantities, the velocities and the average velocities and so forth. So now we're going to apply that to a similar situation in a rotational context. So we have two wheels, identical wheels, or flywheels we should call them. And flywheels are objects designed to have a large angular momentum, to have a large angular momentum, L. And we, of course, have seen already that when the mass is distributed further out, R has a greater effect than M, since I is proportional to MR squared. It is more sensitive to the distance than it is to the mass. So the best way to get the greatest angular momentum, or the, ang the rotational inertia, is to have the mass as far away as possible. And you can see if you look up pretty close, that there's a huge amount of mass here on the outside, which is the case of bicycle wheels. In bic if you look at bicycle wheels, almost all the weight is on the outside. That helps give them a much higher um, angular, uh, ang uh, angular rotational inertia than should be warranted given their mass. But in any case, their moments of inertia are the same. Now, of course, at time zero, they were all there. At the beginning of this race, we have the fierce, ferocious black rhino, and the black rhino is a black rhino because it has a pointed lip. That's one way to tell the difference between a black and a white. Um, it's not so much by the color, it's by the lips. Right, black rhinos are browsers, and white rhinos are grazers, so white rhinos have a square lip, like so. They actually, their maw looks like that. But in any case, we have our dear friend, the, the charging black rhino, and we have our friend, the tiny little meerkat, both of whom are racing. And they're going to race by pushing their flywheels to the end. Now notice these aren't sliding. They are rolling there. And if we look at the, the race starts, and we see the meerkat gets to this location. And the rhino, let me just make that a little clearer. So we can see that this delta x for the meerkat, and you see this is three times the delta x in the same amount of time. So <clears throat> we know that the rhino has <clears throat> got, the, got the flywheel rotating much, much faster. 
it must be rotating much faster. The omega must be larger, and the omega is three times larger. So omega-2 is three times omega-1. Three times omega-1. Now, if alpha is delta omega over delta t, and we have three times omega-1 over delta t, then we would have three times the angular acceleration. So when we consider the net torque, we have three times the rotational acceleration, the same moment of inertia, which means the net torque must be three times as much. The black rhino is providing three times as much rotational force for this race, in this race, than the meerkat is. And so we can see those analogies. Now, the thing to also keep in mind about these rotating wheels is that there is a circumference to the flywheel. And that flywheel is being stretched out. So if we, we can picture uh, breaking this wheel like so and turning it into like a string and then stretching it out and that string might stretch like so, that distance, which would represent C. So in this case, it's delta X, <clears throat> which is the circumference, and the circumference is 2 pi R. And omega is 2 pi R over T. Uh, excuse me, it's 2 pi over T. And so the, the wheel is going to trace out its circumference as it moves away from the starting line. And the linear velocity then is directly related to the rotational velocity. Now again, that should not come as a surprise to you because we know we have this relation up here. V equals R omega. If V equals R omega, the linear velocity is directly proportional to the angular velocity and vice versa. The angular velocity is directly proportional to the linear velocity. So they're directly proportional to each other. So if you double one, you double the other. And that's how the rotational... Newton's second law of rotation applies uh, in this context. If we bring about three times the... If we observe three times the rotational acceleration, that must be caused by three times the net torque.